nice to see everybody. I can see new faces. I'm glad to uh, reopen our uh, YDI lecture series this year. And uh, I'm glad to introduce the speaker, Larry Pixar, uh, from uh, International uh, Trade uh, Department. And uh, he will speak uh, on the science and technology at American Society. I think it will be very interesting. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions at the end of the lecture, because that's usually um, how we have our lively discussions. And uh, please enjoy. Great, thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, like she said, my name is Larry, Larry Pixa. Let me tell you a little bit about myself before I really get started. And then you can ask me any question you want. I don't have to answer it. But you, may, you can base it on the content I give you today or anything on my background if you're curious. Okay? You can even ask me about what's it like to be in the Foreign Service. So I'm a, what's called a Foreign Service Officer. I'm in the US, the American Diplomatic Corps. And I've been doing this for about five years. Um, I'm the trade officer at the U.S. Embassy. What that means is anything dealing with trade between Ukraine and the United States, any issues, um, you know, any technical issues, um, I deal with, or I track them, and I deal with Washington, D.C., the necessary resources. But before my career in the diplomacy, the diplomatic, diplomatic corps, I worked 10 years in the information technology sector. I worked for Microsoft Corporation. And then 10 years before that, so I'm a little old, I worked for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, in Washington, D.C., at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and at Cal uh, the California Institute of Technology, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So my background has been in technology, science management, projects, research, and development. So hopefully that gives you kind of the scope of some of, the, some of what I'm going to talk about. And if you do have questions about any of that afterwards, you know, I'm happy to answer them. But before I really get started, I'm very curious. So we have a room full of people. And how many of you have a background in science and technology? OK. OK. Very good. I am going to use some terminology, and well, also, how many of you are very interested in learning new language? Okay. <laughs> I like that too, because the the space of uh, information technology, science, research and development, and even where it intersects with economics and trade, can have some unique language that um, I think it's important for you to learn. If there's something you don't understand, if I've used a term you don't understand, give me the peace sign. Because I'll keep an eye out, and then I'll use another word, or I'll make sure I define it. I'll make sure to use standard English, but sometimes when you talk technology, you use acronyms. You know, acronyms are abbreviations of language or a special jargon. And I'll try not to do that, okay? But if you're interested, I can teach you something. So, since many of you are not science, scientists or technologists, um, I think it's important to define our terms and what's the difference between science and technology. You hear this all the time, science and technology all smushed together. I want to make sure you understand the difference and why those differences are important. Um, I want to go through some foundational technologies from, and fr from my perspective um, in the United States to give you an example of how technology shapes society, particularly in the US, in the American context. Um, I want to have a little bit of a US values discussion with you, because they may be different from yours. Um, certainly they're different from Ukrainian values historically especially from the, Soviet, the former Soviet legacies. And um, some of this is nuanced and subtle, 
and we can talk about this, and if you have questions, we can spend a little more time on it. I want to talk about intellectual property rights. And this is, can be a loaded subject. It can be very controversial. I'll try to keep it at a high level. There are, I'll admit up front, there are a lot of issues with intellectual property rights. There's a lot of people who find problems or have political issues with intellectual property rights. But I want to talk at a very, very high level because, as I always say, nothing is perfect, right? So I just want to talk about the concept of it. I want to talk about some of the products or commodities that result from the information, oops, sorry, from the in information um, economy. Um, I want to show you some examples of some of these. And I like to have a discussion on, um, I call it made in America, but made in Japan, made in China, or made in Ukraine. This is my opportunity to kind of hear from you. I want to understand what you think and, and what your impressions of, of things that are uh, made in different countries. Um, and I like to also go over some technology trends just to show you some of the hot technology trends that are coming forward um, and take your questions um, in that space. But first, I need to provide you with what's called a disclaimer. So this is not government, US government policy I'm giving you here. Um, this is more intended to be an informal dialogue on the subject. So some of what I'll tell you today is my personal opinion. And I, I hope that I don't offend anybody. Um, but I, I'm not representing the US government right now. Um, I'm really giving you um, some background um, and certainly anything I'm pulling from my own personal experience is definitely personal, okay? So I wanted to start with explaining what's, what the basic definition of what science is, you know? And I won't read the slide to you, you can read that yourself, but science is really, the, it's the way in which knowledge is achieved. It's, it's really a way of thinking. It's a way of observing nature and the environment in order to understand and then create theories, which then can generate technology. So science is, is not necessarily practical. And that's not a bad thing. Sometimes it gets a bad rap, you know? It's, it can be considered very academic. Sometimes it's learning for the sake of learning. It's not learning to produce something or make money. Sometimes science results in money making. Sometimes it doesn't. And, and technology is an attempt to use information that is gathered or gained from science and do something practical. So a lot of computer scientists that I've worked with in the past because my 10 years working at NASA, I worked in super, what's called supercomputing, or high-performance computing. And many of the scientists, if you ask them, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you developing? Why do you want to develop this tool that generates or compresses images that come out of satellites? Why do you want to do this? Like, because it's interesting, or because it should be done. Not because it benefits mankind, necessarily, right? or somebody's actually going to use the tool, or buy the tool, or take the tool and package it, and wrap it up like a Microsoft product and sell it to people. That's not why they're doing it necessarily. But, that technology can be transferred, and it often is. I'll get a little bit more into this later. So, the formal definition is that the purpose of technology is to intervene in the world to produce something other to that which currently exists. I mean, that's very formal. <laughs> Basically, in the private sector, we'd say it's product development. Whether it's a product that you're going to sell, or whether it's a product you're going to use yourself, or you're going to use internally. Um, but what's interesting about science and technology is they have to work together. There's interplay. So, like I said, science explores for the purpose of knowledge. 
and technology explorers for the purpose of making something useful. But science drives the technology. The knowledge that comes from science improves the technology. And then the technology is used to improve the science. So it becomes a systematic. It becomes something that feeds on itself. So without technology, some science doesn't exist. The example I always use is you, you can't study, you can theorize that there are microorganisms like germs and viruses and bacteria. You can theorize that they exist, but you can't see them without a, a microscope. And then once you see them, you realize, oh, maybe there's more there, so I'll create a more powerful microscope. So you do, and then you see there is more there. So you keep going, and the technology improves as the science discovers using the technology. So scientists ask questions based on the, the technology available to them. And I throw up the satellite because I think it's cool. Any questions so far? I mean, do, does everybody understand the difference of science and, between science and technology? It's really not that hard, but it is important to understand that they don't, they're separate, but they must work together. Any questions? Okay, so quiet. Okay. Um, sorry, I keep looking back. Now I want to introduce the terms invention, innovation, and exploitation. Because I view them as unique, unique areas that you have to consider when you're talking about science and technology. So we all know what invention is. Invention is basically creating for the first time some piece of technology. It's not scientific discovery. So maybe you created the, the first typewriter. I'll, I'll show you some inventions later on. Some of them are controversial. Um, um, but innovation is an important aspect because the person who invents something doesn't for the first time doesn't necessarily make the best product. They they make a breakthrough that shows people that this can be done, but they're not use they're not necessarily the best at it. Somebody comes along and says, "I can make that better," so they do. They innovate. They build on top of it. So if you any of you have seen the first telephones, now we have cell phones, right? Same similar concept very, very different um, application of the technology these days. Um, <clears throat> and exploitation, do you all know this term? It's often in English a negative term. Boom. What's that? Boom. It's like exploit. No, no, no. It's not like explosion, but exploit, to exploit something. It means to take advantage of it. So, Oftentimes in the English language you'll hear, you know, uh, this group of people are being exploited, right? Slavery, that's a really good example of exploitation. <clears throat> Severe, horrible exploitation. So exploitation in, in, in many contexts is a bad thing. But in this context, it's, I'm using it in a very neutral way. So. Just because you invented something, or you in, in, innovated on, on, on some idea, doesn't mean it's being used. So, you as a consumer, when you buy a cell phone, you're exploiting the invention. You're making use of it. So I use exploitation as in, a, in, in a more positive way. So I call the consumer the exploiter. So, you all are exploiters when you consume something, some product, uh, or t when you take advantage of something. Um, that's what I mean by exploitation. And the inventor sometimes invents something, doesn't know that they've invented it, or is, is so um, removed from the economy or the context, they are just ignorant. 
like, oh, well, I'll give it away. But does the inventor matter? You know, when you have somebody who invents something, and then somebody who makes it a whole lot better, and then all these people who start to exploit it, sometimes the inventor can be left out. And, and this is where I get into the intellectual property component of the discussion. Um, and this is why in the United States we value invention. You want to, the goal is to protect the inventor, but you still want people to be able to innovate and exploit. So you have to create this whole system um, that allows people to actually invent, work, and use. Um, and this, this is a concept, leader versus follower, I think is an important concept in science and technology. It certainly was a very important concept in when I worked at Microsoft, because there are, um, there are standards, if you're familiar with like the, the um, what's it called, the ITU, um, the, tele well, no, it's the, the International Telecommunications Union, which is a standards body. Basically, it's a UN organization that looks to set standards for mostly for technology, mostly for telecommunications. So standards are important if you want people to work together, you want countries to work together, and you want technologies to work well, whether it's in Germany or whether it's in the United States. And you all know, if you've done any travel at all, you know that some standards aren't the same, right? When you go to some countries, the plug's different. Or the voltage, even. So standards are kind of important, especially within a country. But sometimes they're not. So I had a boss when I worked at Microsoft who always said, Larry, don't pay attention to standards. We want to be innovators. We want to create the standards. So there's a, there's a time and a place for both, right? So you definitely want to fit within standards if you want to sell to a community that's already using something. Um, you know, standards are, are useful for bolts and, and screwdrivers and all of this stuff, you know? Um, and, and all of the electronics you're using today that use batteries and, and, and whatever. So, but sometimes it's necessary to disrupt the standards, create something new. And that's where invention and innovation come into play again. And then there's this concept of merit, what we call meritocracy. Um, this may not be a word you know. Um, you know democracy, there's, um, what are the other words that, you, that use that? Um, but democracy is the big one. Um, Meritocracy is an organization, a society, um, that is based on merit. So uh, the, the corporate culture I worked in before thought of itself as a meritocracy. If you are smart and you earn money for the company, or you invent something for the company, you get promoted. I don't care who you are, what you look like, who you know, who your family is. And that's a nice concept, right? But humans, humans don't really work that way 100%, but it's a nice goal to have. And so um, this is something that in the United States we value. We, vi we value people being promoted on merit. But it doesn't always happen. I mean, when I worked at Microsoft, I saw people get promoted because they were connected to the right people, they were the right place at the right time, um, and sometimes I even think because they looked good, or they dressed really well, and they, people thought they were much better than they actually were. This stuff happens everywhere, all over the world. However, it's a value that we have. It's a value I have. And sure, I probably have my own prejudices, I'll admit it. But it's something we always remind ourselves. Does this person deserve to be promoted? Does this, this person or this idea deserve to, to, does it deserve the investment we're making in it right now? And these are all very important questions. 
as opposed to the whole, like I said, relationship, class, privilege, or wealth. You know, these are definitely not in our value set. Many people in the United States um, left their countries. It's, I guess the exodus really started um, in, uh, in the, the early days with people for religious reasons wanting to come to the United States. But in general, people who worked and achieved were valued. And that's kind of a basic stereotype of us. But like I said, we're very diverse. You know, it doesn't always work that way. But I, th I think these are general values that most Americans would agree that we have. Um, any questions? Anybody want to challenge me? No. <laughs> you can. Think I'm full of crap? No? Yes, sir? How long have you been working in Microsoft? I worked at Microsoft for, for 10 years. And um, I started out um, in a group called something, it was called Technology Integration and Planning. And I deployed technologies before they went to market, before we tried to sell them to customers. So anything new. So um, and I go back a ways. So wireless, the wire, wireless LAN, you know, the thing you take for granted. Wi-Fi, we didn't have Wi-Fi. And I deployed, my group, my team deployed one of the first Wi-Fi's in the corporate uh, environment in the United States. That was back in 2001. Um, and then I was the mobile computing technology manager, so any, the new mobile technologies that were coming out, smartphones were just starting to, to kind of be an idea in 2002. So I worked on deploying those inside the company so people could have smartphones and have their email on their phone. We didn't have email on our phones in those days. Um, people had, had desktop, most people had desktops, or they had a laptop, they were lucky. And if you wanted mobile phone, you didn't have mobile data. People had these things called PDAs. They were um, personal digital assistants. It's like another com little computer, and then you had a phone. So you're carrying all this stuff. Anyway, um, so I did test, mostly it was product testing. Then I moved into um, um, it, what was called executive engagement. So I worked at a very high level with companies from around the world to figure out what kinds of technologies they needed to use within their context, within their companies. And when I left, my final job was working in something called corporate social responsibility programs where I um, worked with organizations to deploy technology to achieve their mission. So I worked in, in child exploitation, so uh, child protection with law enforcement, and I worked in disaster preparedness, working with crisis management organizations around the world to deploy technology so that they could respond, plan and respond for disasters. So I did a lot of different things within that company. But prior to that, I was in research and development at NASA. In, in, like I said, supercomputing. So, <clears throat> to get more into the US context, invention is really what I call in our DNA. It's, it's in our makeup, in our politics. So it's, it's actually written into our constitution. And I've, I, if, you're, if you want to do the research, I can always share this slide deck with you, by the way, if you want it afterwards. And I've got links to the section of the Constitution in this. So it's in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. The U.S. Congress shall have power, blah, 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 to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So if you make an investment in an invention, basically you deserve to get some payback. So you're not driven into poverty. And so you're able for a limited amount of time, recover your costs, but eventually it becomes free for the world to use. And so this was a concept they created. Keep in mind, that was written back in the 1700s. I mean, that's pretty, I mean, I think that's pretty important. And so this, 
we naturally in the United States think this way, which it may not be familiar to you or a, a lot of other people, and we kind of take it for granted as Americans. We, we will, will come someplace and we'll think, oh, well, of course you think like we do, and of course you think this is important, but no, it's not the case, because this is, this is in our, di our political DNA. It's in, it's, it's in our roots. And even when you study civics as a child, you know, you, you kind of, you learn this stuff, either directly or indirectly. But it gets, then we get into pat, the laws that were created, patent laws. I'll talk a little bit more about this stuff. If you have questions, uh, I'll try not to bore you too much with the, the actual legal jargon. Um, typical limited uh, time term of patents is 20 years. There's some controversy there now, because you know how fast technology changes. Um, this is my opinion. This is not policy. But if you look at the IT environment, you patent something for 20 years. Uh, that's a, you go back a year, and that's a dinosaur, right? So if you patented a phone that you're using 20 years ago, like a, digit, uh, a cell phone, can you imagine? Do you remember the bricks that people held to their heads? You know what a brick is? It's a big block, you know? Um, yeah. Good luck, you know. <laughs> Who cares, right? So technology is moving faster and faster, and so the patent system is it may not be. I won't say it's not perfect. I'll say it may not be perfect. Okay, but everything always needs to evolve and improve, and sometimes laws and legislation and regulations don't keep up quite as fast with technology. I do presume that it differs from state to state, but anyway, uh, how much time does it take to register a pattern uh, in the United States? That's that's really, that cost. Yeah, that's a really good question, and I don't have data on that, I'm sorry. Um, I know it takes a while, and I know it can be expensive. Yeah. Um, and I know it probably, you know, the, the data on that probably varies widely based on um, what you're patenting, how much research that needs to be conducted. And if there's any controversy, you know, if it's something entirely new, never been done before, uh, more often than not, though, it's something that is only slightly different from something that already exists. And so then there's a huge process of, of review. And it takes a very special expertise to review that. And yeah, that, that is something that can, um, can impede um, someone's invention. But that's a good question. I'll add it to my talk in the future. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some really basic foundational technologies. Um, and I do, I, I have a, a, a movie I always show to folks, to people. Um, they kind of, it's very simple, but it shows you how technology can really change your society, and it's a, it's a specific example in the United States. But the telegraph um, was, you know, there's some debate about if Samuel Morris actually invented it, or he found it, or he modified something that already existed, because there's not a lot of records from those days. Um, but he was a painter and an inventor. He, but he also developed a code, Morse code, which is still used today. Um, you know the, the system of dots and dashes? Da, 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 da. I only know SOS. Um, but there were other things that were used prior to this that were invented in other countries. Um, generally, military drove a lot of these inventions. So the, these optical semaphore systems which were sight, line of sight, goes back to the old days where people would light a bonfire, and then somebody on the horizon would light another bonfire and keep going. So that's kind of, you know, oh, the, the bad people are coming, right? So it, it, it was based on the need to signal throughout the country that something bad is happening, or you need to prepare for something. And so, um, but, but this was an important breakthrough, particularly in a country the size well, I would say, particularly in, you know, for the size of Ukraine, surely, but in the United States as well. And the telephone. This one is really pretty controversial because 
who really knows who invented the first telephone, right? In the United States, we credit um, Alexander Graham Bell. But, you know, you look through history, you know how history gets written, sometimes in favor of the politically connected, let's be honest. Um, but there, are, there were early voice communication experiments, not in the United States. Um, there's this, this fellow in Italy, um, Antonio Meucci. But, we are pretty certain that Alexander Graham Bell created the first practical invention. So there's some debate whether he was the inventor or whether he was an innovator, right? See where the lines get blurry. A little confusing. Oh. Um, but this is the little movie I wanted to show you, okay? Um, it's very short, it's only like four minutes. spread of railroads across the United States brought a wave of changes to American life. During the railroad boom, thousands of jobs were created, new towns were born, trade increased, transportation was faster, and the overall landscape of the nation transformed. But perhaps the most interesting change of all is the least known, the establishment of standard time. Today, we know that if it is 6.28 a.m. in Los Angeles, it is 9.28 a.m. in New York, 2.28 p.m. in London. 5.28 p.m. in Moscow, and 10.28 p.m. in Tokyo. No matter where you are, the minute and second are the exact same. But before the railroads, there was no need for a national or global clock, and each town kept its own local time. So when it was 12 noon in Chicago, it was 12.07 p.m. in Indianapolis, 11.50 a.m. in St. Louis, and 11.27 a.m. in Omaha. This worked just fine when the only modes of travel were horses or steamboats but it became incredibly problematic when railroads came along. How can you keep a train schedule when each town has its own time? And how do you prevent collisions or accidents on the tracks if train conductors are using different clocks? It doesn't really make sense to leave a station at 12.14 p.m., travel for 22 minutes, and arrive at 12.31 p.m. In order to eliminate that confusion, the railroads of the United States and Canada instituted standard time zones on November 18, 1883 at noon. It allowed the railroad companies to operate more effectively and reduce deadly accidents. The American public, however, was not so quick to embrace this new change, as many cities continued to use their own local time. Resistance was so strong that in some towns, clocks would show both the local time and the railway time. Imagine this conversation. Pardon me, sir, do you have the time? Why, yes. Which do you need? It is 12.13 local time and 12.16 railway time. Ultimately, the logic of keeping a standard time prevailed, and the United States government made time zones a matter of law with the Standard Time Act on March 19, 1918. Since then, there have been numerous changes to the time zones, but the concept of standard time has remained. But the United States was actually not the first to develop standard time. The first company to implement the use of standard time was the Great Western Railway in 1840 in Britain. And by 1847, most British railways were using Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT. The British government made it official on August 2, 1880, with the Statutes, or Definition of Time Act. But while Britain may have been the first to establish standard time, it is Asia and the islands of the South Pacific that enjoy the first hour of each new day. The international date line passes through the Pacific Ocean on the opposite side of the Earth from the prime meridian in Greenwich where, thanks to trains, Standard time was first used. Trains have evolved over the years and remain a prominent form of transportation and trade throughout the world. And from the New York City subways, to the freight trains traveling across the Great Plains, to the trolleys in San Francisco, they all know exactly what time it is. And thanks to them, we do too. So first, let me make a plug for Ted. Anybody heard of Ted? Yeah. Yeah, yeah isn't it cool? 
Yeah. Has anybody been to a TED event? Yeah. Where? Where were we? In the Kiev Polytechnic Institute. It was uh, the previous year. Oh, you had a TED? Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, yeah I, I think that um, they're, they're, they're pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> and I like this film because it shows, I mean, something we totally take for granted, time. Can you imagine going to Lviv and it's like, you know, who knows what time it might be. Um, we take time, we hold, take the, the whole standardized, standardization of time, even around the world, for granted. And it shows how technology really drove that. So the more advanced people became in transportation, the faster they could travel from place to place, the more they realized how screwed it up it was. So that's why I like that example. It shows how technology has, has shaped society and continues to do so. Um, so I just made a timeline of some of the foundational technologies from a US perspective. Um, and I, didn't, I try not to go back too far. I really want to just kind of stay within a, a time frame or a reference um, that you, you, you all might understand or, or relate to. Um, so, and I really wanted to talk about the internet. I don't know if you know, do you, how many of you know the history of the internet? You know some of it? I think it's kind of interesting. It really started out as, um, in something called ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, I started working on the internet in 1987. That's when I started working at NASA. And it, in those days, in 1987, the internet was not public. It was closed. You had to be part of a university or a government facility. Um, and there was no security. It was completely open. You could access anything you wanted. It was kind of cool. Um, so the first email was introduced uh, with the, the TCP IP protocols and file transfer protocols back in the early 70s. Um, things used to work, work on modems. That's where you had to actually dial up. I know some, some people around the world still use dial up though. And I know in some locations where you don't have high speed access, people still dial in. Um, that hasn't entirely gone away, even though that started back in the 70s. And back in those days, like when I started in the 80s, we used dial-up. Not, not everybody could afford a modem. They were very, very expensive. Um, but the internet as we know it really, really got off the ground in the 80s. Um, in 94, one of the first web browsers. So you all know Firefox and what do you use? Safari, um, Internet Explorer, these are the things that exist today. The very first browser created was called Mosaic, and it, was, it came out of a, a laboratory environment. I actually was the program manager for the NASA component of Mo the Mosaic project. So that's how I got into web development to begin with. So back in those days, if you're lucky, well, if you're lucky to get on board a technology that's just coming of age, and nobody really knows it, it doesn't matter what your background is, you can learn it too. So that's what happened to me. I started working with Mosaic and doing web development. Mosaic became Netscape. Netscape eventually went into the browsers that we know today, which are like Internet Explorer, like I said. Um, and that happened in the early 90s. Google 98, Facebook 2004, YouTube 2005. These things have really taken off since. I, I haven't put everything here, obviously. I'm only putting the ones that are still around that you know about. There's a lot of stuff. Anybody remember MySpace? You might not remember MySpace. That was, that was the com competitor with, uh, you're dating yourself. <laughs> uh, it was a kind of the competitor with Facebook. But who uses MySpace now? I mean, Google Plus, it's there. Who uses Google Plus? I, I don't. Um, Twitter. And then I remember hearing people say, oh, that'll never, you know, who needs that? That's never going to go anywhere. Um, but it has its uses, definitely. Um, they say smartphones came about 2007. They actually came out a little bit earlier. iPhones, I had to plug Apple. 
um, and, and 4G in, in the US. And I know Ukraine is just now moving to 3G, right? Yes. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but not all of the US is on 4G. <laughs> Now, this, is, this slide I've created mostly to get you thinking. It's not a definitive list of commodities that come out of the information age. It's mostly to get you thinking about um, products and results of science and technology. So, um, and, and, they're, and, and I cross-cut them by their purpose and their uses. So education. You know, the, the information economy, I call it. Um, not just me, but lots of people call it the information economy. Things that are out on the internet. And how is the internet used? It's used a lot for educational purposes. There's open universities. There's basic research. You can find, maybe you can find the truth on the internet. Maybe you can't. There's a lot of lies out there, too. Um, philosophy. A lot of people use it as a platform to express their opinions. The whole blogosphere, right? These are all good things, in theory. Entertainment. I'm sure you guys download movies. Of course. Music. Yes. Mm -hmm. I won't ask you where from. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, my concerns are about intellectual property rights protection. Um, you know, the commodities that come out of that, that are in the in entertainment category are. Fantasy stories, music, virtual realities, even. Um, um, any of you participate, like in, I don't know, um, World of Warcraft or any of these sorts of online games? These immersion. Nobody? There's no gaming geeks? Yeah? Yeah. Pretty, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Um, I've met people here in Ukraine that have learned their English on these games because you wear headsets and you're talking to people around the world and I, I think that's fantastic. I've, um, my previous post before I worked in Ukraine, I was in Montreal, Canada and I was a consular officer and I used to interview um, people wanting to immigrate to the United States. And uh, we had these days we were interviewing people getting married. And I met so many people who met on World of Warcraft. <laughs> And I think, you know, that's true love. Right? <laughs> you know, you're part of the same guild for 15 years, and you finally meet each other, and you're in love, but you look totally different. They've only ever met in a virtual environment. I met so many couples um, in, in that space. So these, these technologies and these new environments can have unintended per, uh, uh, results as well, like relationships. Um, business really exploits the internet. You know, you've got your Amazons, you've got all your companies that sell, or what we call go to market with products. They use the internet. They use the internet for advertising, for marketing. Um, competitors compete openly on the internet. Um, it's, you know, it has commercial applications. Politics, government. A lot of government services, if you've heard of this e-government uh, trend, where government services are, it's a way for the government to reach and provide services to citizens. This is a good thing. Because at the end of the day, isn't that what government should be doing? Serving the citizens. And Department of Motor Vehicles, you know, where I register in Washington State, in the United States, I do it all online. And I'm in Ukraine, so this is pretty cool stuff. But there's a lot of abuses too, right? So think about the ways in which science and technology is abused, particularly in the information space. All the propaganda, all the inaccurate things that are said. You know, um, disinformation, manipulation, control. It can be abused as well. Um, they used to have discussions with people all the time about new technologies because people can be afraid of new technology. Particularly business people, it's like, what do I need this for? Or, or there's something called liability. So 
aren't you afraid somebody could use this to, um, to do damage or hurt somebody? The example I would always use with, in these discussions would be like, well, there's a, do you know, I'm dating myself, do you know what a typewriter is? The old machines yeah, before yeah. computer? Yeah. <laughs> IBM made these many of these these um, these typewriters. Mm -hmm. Do you want to hold IBM liable or responsible if I pick up that that typewriter and hit you in the head and kill you? Is it their fault that their typewriter got used to hurt you? Right? No, of course not. That doesn't make any sense. So don't be afraid of new technology. Yeah, technology will be deployed and used in unintended ways. It always happens. Um, and it's not necessarily the responsibility of the inventor, you know, unless they make certain claims. So that's, you know, if you say that this will save your life and it doesn't, that could be a problem. Or it depends on what you say your product will do, or you guarantee. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different subject that I won't get into. Any questions about? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm asking whether you put some difference between the information economy and the knowledge economy. So, you know, some scientists now are either arguing uh, that the information society is going to its ending and it started the era of the knowledge society. Do you put some difference here or not? Um, in, in this example, I think there is a difference. I'd say yes. And in this example, I'm being very uh, practical. I'm thinking in terms of the outcomes or products. Um, there's a lot of what, the word is intangible. There's a lot of stuff that you can't define that's happening right now. There's um, something called creative commons. Have you heard of this? Not really. This is a space where people share information freely. Oh. Mm -hmm. There's a whole movement um, and this is where it gets into controversy when you discuss intellectual property rights because there are some people be that believe that every all knowledge should be open to everyone around the world. It shouldn't be restricted. It shouldn't just be in the rich countries. Um, it shouldn't just be with the rich people. And you know, there's some merit to their those arguments. Um, that doesn't mean you should abolish intellectual property rights protection means maybe you should address it differently, maybe you should modify the system, adapt the system to meet the current age. And I think that's our challenge right now. Um, I, I'm not saying either one is bad. Um, but you're right, something is changing in society and around the world. So um, knowledge is becoming more and more shareable and more accessible. And I'll talk a little bit that, about that at the end because I'll talk about some of these these disruptive technologies that are coming that, that will kind of shake the current system. And a lot of people are frightened of that. So let's just have a little discussion about intellectual property. It's, it's a bit nerdy, it's a bit, we call it wonk, it's wonky, it's geeky, it, it, it gets a little technical. Um, but I break it down into, and I've used these terms already, Inventor, innovator, and exploiter, right? Um, so there's something called trade secrets, there's patents, there's trademarks, and there's copyrights. And the system of uh, intellectual property rights protection in the United States, and, and in general, the international standards, are geared, and they're actually, um, uh, the laws and the regulations are written kind of within these categories. Okay, so trade secrets, that's like the recipe for Coca-Cola or Kentucky Fried Chicken. That, those are my best examples. I mean, I don't, maybe that's a secret. I, I think, but I think they would consider it a secret. So, you know, if somebody shares the formula for Coca-Cola, um, you know, and then replicates the actual formula, this could be a problem for their business model, right? That's a good example of a trade secret. Um, patents, it's, you know, uh, it applies to electrical equipment, something that's new, that's significantly different from what existed before. It also applies to pharmaceuticals, too. 
and a lot of medical processes and procedures and things like that. Trademarks, these are like logos. Um, I'll go back to Coca-Cola, you know, the Coca-Cola symbol. Um, if, or, or the Nike, you know, the Nike Swish, that's a, that's a trademark. If somebody uses that on their product, you know, that's not, you know, that would be considered a counterfeit. Um, and copyrights. Copyrights really apply to written works, um, music, books, the arts. Okay? I just want to give you a framework of why, you know, how these things are structured and thought about in the legal context. Um, but why is it important? I mean, uh, at a basic level, what I always try to, to communicate to people is that um, if, if you protect intellectual property, you're also protecting, to a certain extent, consumer product safety, quality. The person who invented it is then producing it for a certain amount of time, setting the standards so that that product is what they say it is, and it will do what they say it will do. This may not be important for some things, but imagine pharmaceuticals, drugs. You want to take the real thing when you're taking it. You don't want to take something that is produced by something, somebody else and counterfeit it. It may not have the same result. It could actually hurt you. Um, it also promotes economic and, in, and, and technological innovation because you, know, you want to give people incentive to invent something or to spend their time and their own resources to invent something. If they know somebody's just going to steal it and take it away and they die in poverty, what's the point? Why would I invent it anyway? How can society move forward? And I think in the United States, our philosophy and in our values is that humans kind of need to have incentives. Incentives drive a lot of innovation. And what, what better incentive can you have than to give somebody a more comfortable lifestyle, give them an income for, what, for their efforts? So I wanted to show you some examples of some of the horror stories. These are, these are some of the things that we actually see today. So um, patent infringement. So you have people who produce drugs that look just like the actual drug, but they're not really that drug, you know. Um, there's examples of, uh, I have heard from the police, uh, here, even here in Ukraine, where certain drugs are colored using cleaning solutions. So they look exactly like the drug produced by a pharmaceutical company in Germany. Uh, who wants to take cleaning solution, you know? Some of the products are dangerous. So if you have products that, uh, that look like the real thing, but then they explode or they burn up, and you have a fire, um, these are real photos from you know, situations in the United States where a lot of fake batteries were coming with laptops, and they caught fire. It was, I mean, it's a real problem if you're on an airplane. And this is my favorite. These are people making Pepsi in a back alley somewhere. And these are, this is real. I mean, who wants to drink Pepsi made in a back alley? What is that? So, um, and th this is from my own experience. When I worked in, in high performance computing, this is, wh this is where I get into how innovation really can impact society. How innovation in one particular space can, can cause things to accelerate. So this is a picture of a wind tunnel at NASA Ames Research Center in California. And I, you can't really get the scale of this, but you could put a 747, a Boeing 747, in this wind tunnel. It's huge. And imagine how, and, and it blows air over the airframe so engineers can see how it will react, right? So they blow actual air over a real plane. And think about the energy costs. You have to reserve that, you know, years in advance. 
and very few people can afford to operate that. It's, a, it's actually a government facility. So you have to have special, even special permission. But the group I was with <coughs> developed tools. At first they were on supercomputers. Now regular computers, most computers you, you, you use, high-end computers you use today can run the software needed to do simulations. And you can simulate airflow over a car over a, a race car, or over um, an airplane. And these are, this, is, this brings in a term called scalability. So suddenly, all of a sudden, overnight, you take this, and you give it to somebody in an office space, or a small company, or anywhere around the globe, and they can do what co cost millions of dollars to do here, for hundreds or thousands of dollars. I mean, that's, that's a huge innovation. So, um, the, the, and this is my real plug for, for um, the United States. Research and development in the United States has a philosophy in the government space where we develop the technologies, then we give them to industry to exploit. Just give it. So, all of these, we call them um, CFD, um, com computational fluid dynamics uh, solutions, the software applications were given away. They were given to local industry, and this won't, shouldn't be a surprise, this is two miles away from Silicon Valley. It actually sits in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. So there's this great partnership between government and industry to take research and development and then exploit it and create product and, and create new companies. Startups, they're called. So it makes, a, it makes something that was not affordable once upon a time suddenly affordable. And then the concept of innovation, which is this iterative process of identifying a problem, collaboration. This is something people don't do well, even in the United States. People get together as a team and share their ideas and work together and actually create and then they can organize their resources and then they can solve and correct the problem and go again and keep improving. Uh, any questions so far? I know I've shared a lot of information and I've gone a little bit long. So, um, <clears throat> this is where I like to ask you when you hear the term made in, made in America, what do you think? Like, just shout out a word. Expensive. Expensive. But with good quality. Good quality. quality. Brand. Brand, yeah, yeah. Fancy. Fancy. <laughs> I'm flattered. Yeah. Apple. Oh, you think of Apple, yeah, yeah. Great, 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 great product, great company, yeah. We still miss Steve Jobs. Anything else? Any bad things? Well, expensive is kind of bad. Some people think expensive is good, I don't. Is it possible but just to, to elaborate a bit more and go back to the values that you showed us? And this is kind of the bad thing that I have in mind with the main in America. Okay. And it's about the ethics. Maybe I, I'm not sure if you did it deliberately, but if you didn't mention the ethics of the your value of doing business and doing innovations. But as for me, uh, for example, the usually in the Amer in the United States innovations, it's like again maybe I'm, I'm mistaken in this point of view, but innovations usually they come from big corporate business and because usually they have money to like uh, operate this R&D centers and everything and for example for me this is a kind of weak point of uh, American business because when we have uh, on the one hand corporate interests and on the other hand for example some ethic issues for example environmental issues for example in the area of oil uh, business or I don't know chemistry or something like this and there is a big conflict between these two kind of areas and usually I, I know some stories like from big American brands 
and the different issues that they have with the labor, for example, mm -hmm. that when they outsource their business to China and use uh, cheap labor in some severe conditions, or for example, some uh, environmental issues, again, with oil industry. And that's why, mm -hmm. it's for me, I have some, maybe it's, again, some bad association with the Made in America. It's like always some, some signal uh, in my mind that it should be something like with the kind of this ethics. Yeah. I, I would say those are, that's an international problem, an international business problem, and particularly an international big business problem. And, and there is, I think there is that natural tension between government policy, government regulation, and capitalism. I mean, capitalism and, and the, the good of society, the greater good of society. So you have those natural tensions. <coughs> And so I would, I would agree with you somewhat that, that those issues arise. But it's, it's been, I've read a number of studies, and I've seen it myself working at Microsoft, that innovation doesn't necessarily come from big places. And this is the import, or invention. So this is why this whole concept of startups, small businesses that start out of garages in people's houses, is so important and and this is why I'll go back to Silicon Valley that it's it's a unique place and people have attempted to replicate that that model mm -hmm. elsewhere to to various degrees of success and it's in a particular area it's um it's IT you know it's technology um, but I think you're talking more about like petroleum and and the pharmaceutical industry as well and yes, these are being widely debated now, and um, and you know this whole discussion of our pharmaceutical firms developing the drugs people actually need or the ones that they can actually sell, mm -hmm. and yes, that's an active debate, and and I hope that the debate continues. Um, however, I'm not here to comment on that. <laughs> um, I, I do have my personal opinions, um, and. Um, I, I hope that this debate is lively and moves forward and then actually we continue to have it in the United States with our own healthcare discussion. You know, we've just gone through this, we're still going through um, the, um, the healthcare, um, you know, making healthcare available for the general public rather than just through private businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're experiencing some, some pain in that space ourselves. So it's a good point. Um, what does made in Germany mean? Quality. Quality. China? <coughs> Widespread. That's a good one. Not, not always, but quality. Hey, Chinese market. So, what what does made in Ukraine mean? And creative. Creative. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. Agriculture. <laughs> products. <laughs> products look. Yeah. Okay. Well, you must have. There's local Ukrainian products. You must. You must like. IT sphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's there's a lot up and coming there. What 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 would you like it to mean? And you don't necessarily have to answer that. But I want you to think about that, because you guys, many of you are just starting out yourselves. And some of you are already working in, in professional spaces. When I see that something is made in Ukraine, it makes me proud yeah, that something is going on and, and things are improving here. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I lived here in, uh, I was in Ukraine for two years in 97 and 98, 1997 and 1998. And I'm here now. I just flash forward, I did all this stuff, and now I'm here back. And I've seen a lot of change. I've seen a, I see a lot of products made in Ukraine that were not made here before. So I do see change. Um, but I just want you to think about that, because you're the ones that will drive that. That, that, that quality the technology, the innovation that it takes to actually make something that other people will want to buy. So, um, future trends, 
just to put some things out there for you to consider before I end. Um, these are just some of the top things that people are talking about on the Forbes list, um, some of the popular science um, blogs. Um, so it's predicted in the near future that computing will be everywhere. We know the internet is already, most, most places have Wi-Fi now in most cities. Um, the prediction is become, be going to become more and more prevalent and lower cost if it has a cost at all. There's lots of cities that are now deploying free Wi-Fi around the world. Um, and there's lots of people talking about internet access, information access being a human right. You know, you have some countries that are actually exploring this. And I think that the more we move forward, the more people become accustomed to having access and, and demanding it, the more people are going to expect their societies to provide it. Um, so I, I think there's some credibility there. 3D printing, I've been following this. 3D printed cars and guns and all kinds of things. I don't know. I mean, it may allow manufacturing to come more local. So you can manufacture parts that you would otherwise need to order from another country. Blockchain, anybody familiar with that? Really? Bitcoin. Exactly. Bitcoin uses the blockchain database. And, and people are starting to look at blockchain because it is a database that people can contribute to, but they cannot change. And everyone can see. So imagine if your government was required to put all of its information in a database it couldn't mess with, it couldn't do anything to, and once it's there, you could see it. You could see the truth about what was being reported. So there are some predictions that blockchain will be used by governments in the future. Um, the database. I'm not making a plug for Bitcoin at all. It's, Bitcoin actually just uses the technology. So Bit, Bitcoin can be a bit, a bit controversial. Context-rich systems. This is really bordering on artificial intelligence. Machines that actually know what they're supposed to be doing and can correct themselves or can actually do something under conditions that have a lot of uh, variances where there's a lot of change. This scares some people, I guess. Um, cloud computing, everybody familiar with cloud, the cloud? Yeah, yeah, both. Yeah, exactly. So you no longer need to have software locally. You can just access things on the cloud or use applications that are um, uh, you know, in a web environment, in an internet environment. And then smart machines. These are, this is like the robots. You know, the things you see coming out of Japan. Um, perhaps coupled with artificial intelligence. You know, uh, 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 workers. You already see robots, though, in, in the automotive industry. In a lot of industries, a lot of... Um, but you, you certainly don't see them in you know everyday life. So, um, so anyway, any last questions? Anybody want to? Yeah. Uh, it's about your background. Uh, before entering the IT sphere, um, uh, your education was uh, gained by, um, mostly at the university, or you were developing yourself by. Uh, self-education. What is more important nowadays? To gain <coughs> standard education or just develop by yourself? Okay, that's a good question. And I have a personal um, opinion. So it's definitely not, you know, take this for what it's worth. I'm just going to share with you what I think. My background is liberal arts. Most people are surprised by that because I got into science and technology. Um, my undergraduate degree is a Bachelor of Science in Linguistics. Mm -hmm. So, Bachelor of Science. It wasn't Bachelor of Arts. So I was, I was a little analytical already. So I was into languages and how the nature of language and, and language acquisition and how language actually works. Morphology, syntax, if, you, if you're familiar with these terms. Mm -hmm. So when I got out of school, I couldn't find a job. Because who hires... Back in, in the 80s, the economy was terrible, and um, I had studied Spanish and French. I was a linguist who spoke Spanish and French. 
I couldn't find a job. So I learned how to program. It's just another language. Programming languages are actually easy. If you've learned, oh my god, if you know Russian, <laughs> if you've learned Ukrainian, and you can speak French, or another language, and you're learning English, for God's sake, you can learn how to program. Because it's standard. There's no irregulars. So you can learn how to program. So I taught myself how to program, and I found a very, I started to get good jobs. And that's what drove me into technology. And then once I worked at NASA, um, they sent me back to school. So I, I got a degree in science and technology policy. Still not hard science, more in the policy space. And I continued down the route of learning technology on the job. So I learned how to program. I did web development. Um, I, and I started to manage scientists and technologists. And so I'll go back to my college degree and the people who taught me. And, and I'd have to say in retrospect, I'm 53 years old right now, OK? So in retrospect, I would say they were right. Um, I was taught by the Jesuits. I went to a Jesuit school. I went to Georgetown University. And the Jesuits always said, teach a person how to think and then they can continue to learn. And they really taught me how to think. Um, and, and through the liberal arts and the Bachelor of Science methodologies of, of learning linguistics and language, um, they taught me how to acquire more information. And, and I, I'll credit them with, you know, with, with that. It, I think if, if I had gone straight into the sciences, I would have taken a very different path. And I wouldn't be a diplomat. And now I'm a diplomat. So some people think my background is a little odd for some of the things I've done. But for me, it's been a rather natural <coughs> progression. So I would recommend learn how to learn, be capable of learning, because learning is a lifetime experience now. Things change very much quicker than when I was starting out. And you're constantly having to retrain yourself, because there's nothing more constant than change, so they say. It might be a bit personal question, but anyway, uh, as you told you, you were working in the private sector for a long period of time, and then you switched to public. What were the reasons for that? Um, <clears throat> I had very specific reasons for wanting to go into diplomacy. Um, when I left Microsoft, I had been working in, in mm -hmm. government relations, and I worked a lot in Europe. And I worked with U.S. Embassy personnel often in the economic affairs space. And many of my issues coming from the IT sector, from Microsoft, were the same as for Google or Oracle or any of these other companies. And I really found myself very, very interested in those broad issues and wanting to represent US companies. And I would see these people at the embassy and, I'm, and I was like, I could do that. That would be interesting. And so I kind of set a goal to, to really leave the private sector and went through the whole process of becoming a Foreign Service Officer. If, I don't know if you've read about it, but it's a whole year-long process to study and learn and interview to be um, a U.S. diplomat. And so it was a personal goal of mine all, all along, and I thought about it for a very long time, um, actually ever since college. I was, it was always in the back of my head, wouldn't it be interesting? But now I feel, having the experience I, 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 I've gained from the private sector, I think um, I'm, I'm, uh, I enjoy, certainly enjoy this work more because I have context. And I think that um, hopefully I'm able to add some more value um, for, what, for the job I have to do for the US government. So, um, and it was a personal decision. Private sector. Um, you know, you, you can reach a point in the private sector where you do have to admit that what you're doing is for profit. And you are always selling. You are always trying to promote your product. And <clears throat> for me personally, I wanted to move more into the public space of public good. Um, and, and the hours and... Uh, I'm not saying this work is any easier, but um, it was just different. 
and intense. You know, I worked almost seven days a week. Um, so it was, um, it was time to change. <coughs> What do you think, uh, what is the uh, uh, main uh, problems that uh, uh, slow, down, slow down the uh, uh, technical development of Ukraine? Uh, undeveloped uh, intellectual property market or, uh, I don't know, maybe it, uh, incentives for business uh, or uh, laws? Law? That's a great question. Um, there's a good example I'll use, a um, very recent one. Um, intellectual property rights protection, it's not just about protecting Hollywood artists or musicians from abroad, but Ukraine has an opportunity to create a local music industry. And um, there's a lot of great artists here in Ukraine, but they need a way to actually earn a living. So they need to be able to profit from what they create or make versus, you know, have it just be free for everybody. So there needs to be some model where Ukrainian citizens can afford to buy it and that the musicians can actually earn a living. And otherwise, what happens is, um, and I was in a meeting recently with our ambassador and a, a local artist, and they were telling me stories of of how um, composers, composers of modern music, in order to earn a living, they have to go elsewhere. You know, if they're really, really good, maybe they go to London, maybe they go to New York. Why shouldn't they stay here? Well, they don't really, they want to stay, but because intellectual property rights is such a problem in the country right now. Now, I, if you really are interested in this topic, I just wrote an article, it's all in English, so it's give you some good language. Um, and they're, they're sitting you know, right here. Anybody who wants a copy of the article, there's a few here, that talks about the challenges of intellectual property rights and, and trade. And, and you really want to promote local industry. You want to keep local talent. You want to protect and keep local invention. Um, there's lots of examples. Um, Drugs, pharmaceuticals, for example, there really isn't a lot of local creation of pharmaceuticals in Ukraine because licensing of those drugs, local licensing isn't protected. Why is that important? Well, right now drugs are imported from, for, from abroad. World prices, very expensive. But if you could protect local licensing and produce some drugs in Ukraine, they'd be far cheaper. They might even be a quarter of the price. Who knows? Um, but there's a lot of reasons why you want to, and, and if you protect local talent, you might keep local talent from moving. And then you have your own opportunity to create your own startup environments. Um, so that's why I think intellectual property rights is, is so important. And those are some of the big challenges for Ukraine today. And we have discussions on a regular basis now with, with the government, with our U.S. trade representative. One of the, um, I, I, I'm responsible for managing a very high level meeting called the, the US-Ukraine Trade Investment Council. And it's a bilateral discussion between the Minister of Economy and the US Trade Representative about how trade issues can be resolved and addressed. And intellectual property rights is a big one. And that's what that article is all about. So. Yes. Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, question. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, you worked in NASA, and uh, uh, I connected this with. Uh, it's not about uh, some disruptive uh, in, uh, innovations, and I want to uh, ask, uh, what about uh, space innovations? Uh, we. Uh, it's, uh, it's very hard, uh, it's difficult uh, to, earn, to uh, afford uh, human beings. And uh, what about space inventions? Uh, should we uh, wait some of them? And uh, what kind uh, could it be? Um, <clears throat> I mean, to, to improve, like, 
potential space travel, this sort of thing? For example, yes. Yeah. Um, and is, it, is it important? Well, speaking from a NASA perspective, missions, if you actually have a mission to go somewhere, that drives a lot of technology. So, um, very specific things drive technology. And I'll give you an example. This comes from our spin-off magazine from NASA. Um, CD-ROM. You guys know about CD-ROM, right? Yeah. It's optical, right? Why is it optical? <coughs> Does anybody know why CD-ROMs were invented? Not, not just because it's smaller, but um, you, everybody remember um, magnetic media? When you, you know, cassettes and all that? Yeah. Well, when you, when you radiate that, it erases it. Mm -hmm. When you send it into outer space, it gets wiped out. Mm -hmm. So you need an optical media. So if you have deep space missions, like everybody remember Voyager? Mm -hmm. Voyager, Voyager, all of these, these deep space missions use uh, optical disks. Now, the optical disks are this big. Well, maybe this big. I don't know if you remember those. Um, it, to store data or backup data so that if they get erased, they can reboot. So, um, Space missions drive a lot of technology that used today. That's the point. And so I, I, I get your question. There's a lot of challenges associated with human factors, with the human factor. Like when you, you go into space and you're without gravity for a long time, how do you, how do you deal with that? You know, there's a lot of issues. Um, but actually, I'm out of the loop on most of them right now. So. But my experience was working on computing as it supported missions. So missions to whether it was to put a satellite into orbit or to send a deep space satellite required some sort of computing. And the groups I worked in supported that requirement, if, if that makes sense. And some of, some, of, some of those applications were supercomputing applications. So, so we wound up working across a lot, of, a lot of stuff. We were like the plumbing for missions. Information technologies like that. So anyway, I don't mean to keep you guys. It's getting late. So you've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.